well, good evening and uh, welcome back to our midweek Bible study. Last week we took a look at the first 12 verses of Colossians chapter 1 in which we looked at Paul's prayer on behalf of the Colossian brethren and discussed how we should be praying for those same things on behalf of our brothers and sisters in Christ today. We're going to pick up this evening in verse number 13. We'll be looking at verses number 13 through 12 or through 20 in which Paul illustrates the the preeminence of Christ as the creator as the head of the church and as the redeemer of the saints so we're going to pick up like I said in verse number 13 it says for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins Paul says for uh, we have this inheritance because God rescued us. He transferred us. He took us from one place, and he transferred us to another place. He took us out of the lost category, and he put us into the saved category, which is uh, the kingdom of his son, the, the church. In the book of Philippians, uh, the word in is a, a very important word, and really the word in is a very important word all throughout the Bible, specifically in the New Testament, and this is one of those situations where we need to pay attention to that word in. Uh, it says Christ, uh, he died so that we might be redeemed. That's bought back. He made the payment with his blood that we deserve to pay or we should have had to pay. He made a payment that had to be paid. The he book of Hebrews tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And he paid the price for us to receive the forgiveness of sins. Uh, we asked the question, you know, who has access to the forgiveness of sins? And the answer to that question is everyone. Uh, he died so that we all might have access to the forgiveness of sins. But who has received the forgiveness of sins? Those people who are in him. It says, in him we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. How do I get into Christ? I am baptized into Christ. We who have obeyed the gospel, been baptized into Christ, have redemption and the forgiveness of sins, which enables us to, as Paul said just a few verses before, enables us to joyously give thanks for everything that he's done for us. So picking up in verse number 15, uh, Paul gets into uh, an illustration of who Christ is, a description of who Christ is. He says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. Paul gives a description of Christ in these verses. And this section of scripture is very similar to the beginning of the book, the Gospel of John. Because both are trying to establish really the same point. They're trying to convince their readers that... Jesus of Nazareth, the man, is actually deity as well. So Paul says he, Christ, the one who made that possible, the one who made it possible for us to have this inheritance, the one who has redeemed us, is, he says, the image of God. Verse number 15, he is the image of the invisible God. John said, back in John chapter 1, verse 1, the Word was God. John chapter 1 verse 14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten, the Father, full of grace and truth. So John tells us that the Word, we understand that to be Jesus, was God. Uh, John chapter 1 verse 18 says, No one has seen God, that's God the Father, at any time, the only begotten God, that's Jesus of Nazareth, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. He has shown him to us. So John said the word was God, that's Jesus. He was in the beginning with God, uh, and he is God. He is the 
explanation. He is the visible representation of God. Jesus himself, when uh, saying to the Jews who were plotting to kill him and for claiming to be equal to God, he said to them, And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. And in John chapter 14, when Jesus was comforting his apostles as he was about to go to be crucified, you remember he said he goes to prepare a place for them, Philip asked Jesus, show us the Father. And Jesus responded to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? So John said he was in the beginning with God. He is the explanation of God. Jesus himself said that if you have seen me, then you have seen the Father. Paul said he is the image, the physical representation of the invisible God. Alexander Campbell had a great sermon that looked at Jesus from the perspective of the word there in 1 John, uh, that word being translated as logos. Uh, a word for more than just word. It's, it's a difficult thing to try to put into words, uh, but, but it's, it's more than just a word for word. Uh, it, it goes into ideas and, and representations of things. A word is a representation of something else. A thing, the thing, whatever it may be, may exist before a word for it does. We go back to the Garden of Eden and God brought all of the animals before Adam, and Adam named those animals. So, that, say, a camel, it existed before Adam called it a camel, but as soon as he gave it that name, then camels were just as old as the animals, animals were. Uh, once you call it a camel, uh, the word and the thing become one. And, and that's a kind of complex thing to, to think about sometimes, but I think we try to make it more complicated than it really is. You know, I call this my hand. It's a part of me, but it isn't me. I, I don't think we're going to go so far as some people go and say, well, it's not a, a part of me. It's just a thing. I'm something separate than my hand, but, but I am something other than my hand. I say my hand hurts or my belly aches or my legs are sore. I'm something more than my body. My body is just the part of me that you see. And so Jesus is just the part of God that we see uh, or have seen. People have seen at, at different times throughout history. Jesus, the word, is the physical representation of God. He is God. Verse number 16, Paul goes on to say, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. <coughs> John, back in John chapter 1, said all things came into being through him, uh, being the word, being Jesus of Nazareth. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Paul said, by him all things were created. Uh, that is the, the physical world, the animals, the trees, all of those things that we read about being created back in Genesis, the, the book of Genesis, all those things were created by the word, were created by Jesus. And not just the physical things that we see, but Paul lists also dominions and rulers and authorities. That means governments were created by Jesus. God is in control and Jesus is in control. He is the creator of everything. He is the portion of the Godhead that uh, creates. Ever heard anyone say, I don't understand everything I know about that? That's something uh, my dad says that all the time. I, I don't understand everything I know about that. When it comes to the Godhead, sometimes I have to say, I, I don't understand everything I know about that. I don't understand exactly how each individual part played out their roles in in the, the creation process, but whether I understand it completely or not, my brain's not, not big enough to understand everything. And whether I understand it or not, I know it's the case because the Bible says it's true. And so Jesus is listed here by Paul as the creator. 
He goes on in verse number 17, saying, He, Jesus, is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Some people may get twisted up back in verse number 15 in that phrase, firstborn of all creation. Uh, some people try to claim that, that Jesus is a created being, the way that angels were created, the way that humanity was created. But the Bible is very clear on the fact that Jesus, the word, is just as eternal as God the Father. John said in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word he was in the beginning with god when jesus was being questioned by the jews and he made that statement i am uh, that was in reference to the same statement that god made to moses within the burning bush i am who i am that statement meaning that i exist i have existed i will exist in the future i, I am eternal and paul said he is before that phrase means has existed prior to all things i mentioned a moment ago campbell's sermon on the word on logos and he emphasized the the dangers of believing that jesus's existence began in bethlehem in a manger i know lots of times people want to focus on <clears throat> the birth of jesus and and think about jesus being born in that manger and it's true that physical baby was uh, born there in that manger but Jesus the word he existed prior to that if we begin to think of Jesus as beginning his existence that day in that manger that evening that night in that manger then we put ourselves in danger of being close to where the Colossian brethren were getting awful close to as viewing Jesus as a man or as a created being, as anything less than God. And that's a dangerous place to be in. We need to understand that he is eternal, that he is God. Continuing on into verse number 18, Paul says he is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Uh, we will kind of go over the first place in everything. He deserves to be first place in everything, but we're going to focus on him being head of the church. He certainly deserves to be first place in everything in regards to any of us who call ourselves Christian. And I suppose, you know, stepping back and looking at things from the perspective of these Colossian brethren who had been influenced by the Gnostics in that, they viewed anything as physical, as, as unclean, anything physical, as, as sinful. And so being influenced by that, I can see how they might have a problem as understand, in understanding Jesus as the head of the church. <clears throat> as I mentioned last week, we'll speak about later, it led to them, you know, worshiping angels and all sorts of other things that that problem that they had with with not respecting him as the head of the church and viewing him as less than God it it led to these types of problems and, and even though we don't deal with that particular problem it's still something that people need to learn today that that Jesus is the head of the church not not me as a preacher uh, not the elders not an individual who gives biggest contribution uh, not the most influential person in the congregation but Jesus is the head of the church we're all just supposed to be doing what he wants us to do and so certain organizations certainly need to understand that uh, because they have you know forsaken what Jesus has said and, and let men dictate what they are doing and so Paul within these he speaks of Jesus being preeminent he, he's supposed to be first place in everything. He's the creator. He is our redeemer. He is eternal. He is God. He's the head of the church. That means that we, the church specifically, should put him first in everything that I do. Now, I can see how those individuals who were influenced by Gnosticism, uh, who viewed God as, as elevated above Jesus and as Jesus of Jesus as just a man, 
if that's the way that you viewed things, and you remember back to passages in the Old Testament, such as, you shall have no other gods before me, I can see how giving Christ the preeminence that he deserves would have been something they would have had difficulty with. And, and so I think that's why the Holy Spirit cleared up in verses 19 through 20 that it was God the Father's plan the whole time for Christ to have this preeminence. He said, for it was the Father's good pleasure verse number 19, for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, making, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Paul clarifies that, that this is God's plan. It is God the Father's plan for Christ to have preeminence. You know, Paul discusses these fundamental aspects about who Jesus is because these specific brethren had been influenced by those Gnostics and, and they didn't understand properly the deity of Christ. While we may not be practicing Gnosticism today, we certainly need to understand uh, the complexity of who he was so that we don't get stuck on seeing just one aspect of Christ. We looked last week at the, the dangers of focusing in on just one aspect of God, and the same is true if we get stuck on one aspect of Christ. It could be easy to take passages such as John 3, 16, for God the Father so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son. We could take verses like that that, that certainly clarify for us the love that God the Father had in sending his son and allowing his son to die on the cross or passages such as back in Isaiah chapter 53 uh, verse number 6 says but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him or verse number 10 but the Lord that's God was pleased to crush him that's Jesus putting him to grief and so it would be easy, it could be easy to take passages such as those which do illustrate very wonderfully the love that God the Father had for us, but we could see those verses and we could begin to put Jesus in a victim category. Well, God the Father made Jesus do this, and Jesus was just that, that innocent sheep, and, and he was just a victim in this scenario. And so it's important for us to grasp the concept that, that Jesus was not a weakling. Jesus was not a victim. Paul clarifies that he is the creator, that he is eternal, that he's not just some human created by God in order to offer as a sacrifice. Just like the Colossians, we need to understand the power and the supremacy of Christ in order for us to understand the love that he had for us in, in giving up his life and sacrificing himself uh, whenever he could have done something about it. He chose not to because he loved us so much. And so we need to understand the, the power that Christ had and the authority that Christ had so that we can see that he offered himself uh, as a sacrifice on our behalf. All right, we will end right there. Next week, we will look at the remainder of Colossians chapter 1, as well as the first five verses of chapter 2. We'll kind of group all of those in together. I hope seeing, I hope I see many of you back here at, at worship service this Sunday morning at 10 a.m., uh, but we will be uh, on the internet for those of you who are still uncomfortable in, in being in a large group of people. And again, if you have any questions or comments, please send them to Salina Church of Christ at gmail.com. Thank you.